Okay, I want to double check some things when we get done. So here we go. Okay, analysis of archaeological materials and those four big categories. All right, so generic phrase for what we recover is the archaeological record. Means anything that we can recover from past human activity or behavior. That's our record. Typically, we can put what is preserved or what remains in four big categories. They can overlap a little bit, but we're not gonna overlap them in an intro course. So artifacts. Next one, ecofacts. Features, and sites. So as you work through, going through this, when you do a little review or read uh, some of the other uh, text reading assignments for this unit, when you get ready to answer some questions, for assessments, these are going to have specifics, and then you might also see them with some illustrations. Artifact, ecofact, feature, and site. So any of these are going to give us an opportunity to find out something and do some analysis of human activity or the behaviors that humans were going through. So let's take a look at each one separately. Firstly, no matter whether we're looking at artifact, ecofact, site, feature, we're thinking about and need to remember whether or not we can see or support that what has been recovered or identified is either in its primary context, or as you could guess as a college student, the next phrase would be secondary context. Primary context means we have located it in the area or context that it was originally being used by whoever made it or the first group that was there creating and using. Quick example, if we were to find, uh, oh, here's a good one that's in social media all the time. If we were to find the remains of a house in Italy that was covered with volcanic material during the eruption of Vesuvius, as they excavate, because people ran for their lives, things that are dropped on the floor or uh, dogs that are still chained to the gates are in primary context. That's where they were used. That's where they lived. That's where they were doing their work. Secondary context is most likely though where most of our archeological materials or record is coming from. In secondary context, and the reason why I'm saying most, in secondary context, it could be something like we have found and if you're an archaeologist, you're super excited about it, the garbage dump. Yay, garbage dump. So anything that was broken, used up, finished, in the way, then cleaned up and moved to another location, usually not very far from where 
they were living or where they were doing their work. If they've got a little canyon, valley, hillside, just like today, which you see it alongside our freeways and things like that, people just move stuff and push it down the hill. In some contexts, they might actually make a big pile of it and then bring in clean dirt and put the dirt over the top to clean it up. So a garbage dump would be a secondary context. It could also be things that were made in one area and traded away and have stayed popular and people are still using them, wearing them, owning them. And they might've been tools in the ancient world, but now they are collectibles in the modern world because we don't have any time limit. So some of you might be um, the current users or owners of things like, um, let's say necklaces, pendants, earrings, adornments that are actually a couple hundred years old or a hundred years old from your family, right? I'm very interested in um, a type of silver. It looks like a pendant, but it was originally attached to men's watch chains and they're called fobs. And they usually are engraved on the back with a date and a stamp that says what country they come from and frequently what uh, the person's name or sometimes they were given as awards. It was back before they had trophies. And they're generally from Ireland, Scotland, or Britain. I have some family members that came from that area. And yeah, so for me, I use them on chains or something else, but they're, my oldest one I think is about 130 years old. So that's secondary context. So if you've got antique furniture, or you are living or uh, visiting, let's say maybe a, um, a tourist center in Highland Guatemala and out in the garden area where you can sit and have coffee or lunch, there'll be some stone sculptures that are 2,500 years old. Those are in secondary context. So primary versus secondary. Our analysis for getting more meaning out of them is strongest when it's primary context or if it's secondary, like a garbage dump that's linked to that community, then, then we get more information about them. The more removed they are in space and time from where they originally came from, then the less human information we can get from them. Okay. And just as a review from Tuesday, if we find them during an excavation and we have the three-dimensional location of context, our 3D, where is it and how far down in a mapped area, then we have, if we have that, then we know the provenience. And if we have strong provenience, that's our best case for study and analysis. So if we've got its exact provenience. All right, next. So just be sure that as you put something together, not for the quiz next week, but aiming towards your exam, which is, we'll be moving on to some other things, but I'm not gonna ask you to do that until the 25th, just so you get a, you know, a better feeling and have plenty of time to get all your classes started and so forth. So once it's exam day, you've got your notes or your outlines ready to go, because it's open book, open notes for you to work through. So the more organized your notes are, better your assessment will go. Um, just be sure you have primary and secondary context and why it matters. And what is provenience? That'll come up in chapter two. But you have the definition here and it isn't really too much more um, complex than that. And how does the word provenience relate to the phrase in C2? I'll put that in chat too. 
in situ. It sh shows up often in archaeological reading or reports. Another term that might show up would be matrix. That one's gonna show up in your reading too. Not matrix like the movie. Okay, you also, I'm pacing this Thank you very much, Estella. Based on seeing that when she jots something down and when she's finished jotting. So camera is on when you're with an instructor where we're doing something like this. That's your checklist or jot list, getting ready for doing an essay or an activity or an exam or something. Super helpful. <laughs> All right. And next one here. So one more time, our four main categories of finds or information in chapter two, artifact, ecofact, feature, and sites and settlements. All right. Ecofacts are going to be the more oddball one that you probably haven't heard of. But when something's an ecofact, we're finding something that is not manufactured by a person. So, right, it's not a tool or a pot or a piece of jewelry, or their house, or a walkway, or a boat, or a fireplace. It's going to be something natural that humans were using, bringing in to their environment, and that had a purpose for them. But when we find it later, it still looks like, let's say, a tree branch, or a rock that came out of the riverbed. So these are going to be things where we're looking for some of their environmental clues and some other purposes that humans might use them. So you all, you can give me a little, a little thought on this one and maybe put it over in chat. If we find human skeletons or human bone or human teeth, what would they belong to? Are those artifacts, ecofacts? What would human remains be from the ancient world? Yeah, and you all, um, and I know sometimes depending on what you're using to uh, log into the class and participate, even if you already see someone else answer something and you think they're correct, it will help you to easily remember, recall, and calm down during assessments if you go ahead and type it in too. Uh, because right when we create and we when we make something, when we do something, your brain starts making those file folders that you can recall again a little bit more. So even if you, um, even if you uh, are not thinking that what someone else has already said is um, incorrect, it's good to, to uh, participate. As we go through the class and we do things that are a little bit more complex than what we're doing right now, I'm gonna actually call you out and push you a little bit more to participate over in chat. So yeah, this site that's in the picture behind me is one that I excavated at. And because there were a lot of rodents, it was not unusual for me to just find single human teeth. <laughs> I didn't see the whole body sometimes because right when the rodent's digging a hole and they go through a grave or a burial, they're pushing the dirt out of the way and making the hole. So sometimes their spare dirt was dragging along. I was always thinking, oh, okay. And uh, initially it, it wasn't something that completely rang a bell for me as to why I was finding single teeth. And I was wondering, did they pull teeth? Did they save teeth? Is this something else? And then I realized, no, a natural critters in the environment were just pushing through. They weren't 
eating the bodies, they were just digging in the area because the bodies had been buried over 2000 years ago. All right. So some definitions and some examples, artifacts. Artifacts are going to be things that are portable, um, made by humans, clearly. They're gonna have some sign of human cutting, sawing, shaping, handling, manipulation to them. So they're gonna be completely made by humans or things that are modified and then used for something. And when we say use, it could be anything. It could be an ornament, could be a game, could be a kid's toy, could be something that you need to survive. So an artifact shows us what they were using and how they wanted it to look. But artifacts also give us an idea of what resources they had available and what technology they were interested in using. If someone is making something and while they're shaping it or creating it, they're making a lot of debris or garbage, that's also an artifact. So all the flakes that come off of when they're chipping a stone to make, let's say make a um, knife, all the chips and flakes that are maybe just still left on the ground, those are also artifacts. They were created by human activity. The term portable. Portable means that they intended to move it around. With enough people in a giant community and leadership, there are some things that are not really listed as artifacts that are ginormous. And they intended to shape them, put them in spawn one spot and never move it again. We have a different term for that one. So yes, people shape stones and put them together to create Stonehenge but Stonehenge isn't an artifact. They never meant for it to move again. So your house, yes, all the little pieces in it uh, show that we did that, but we've got another term for that. So these are gonna be things that you might trade, carry with you, move from room to room where you're living, carry them out into the field when you're gonna go hunt or collect plants or you know, work as a healer, those kind of things. Now, manuport there meant carry by human hands, that it couldn't have gotten to that area or the materials couldn't have gotten to that area by any uh, recognizable manner other than humans carrying it around. So the goal of artifact analysis is to, like we talked about a couple times ago, once we're gonna do analysis, identify some general categories, and then look for patterns. We'll look to see what shapes are they making or what materials are they making or what's their favorite color for that kind of object. So materials categories are frequently just the raw materials. And this term here, I'll put it over in chat just in case you didn't already know it. Lithics is archaeology or college speak. And it means stone. So lithics are going to be things made out of stone. You're noticing this in your majors too, right? There's a lot of things that we have everyday things for, and then you get to college and it has a college speak. Another dimension of analysis might be how did they use them? We might not be in the stage of analysis where we're worried about what something's made out of anymore. That might be well recorded. Um, and they might be really trying to take a look at how they were used. Is it something that seems to be in and around whatever the household is? Because remember, house could be a portable um, tent-like structure like we still see in places of uh, North Asia. 
It could be agricultural work, hunting, weaving, child care, health, right? So we try to do that. Now with use categories, then provenience, right? And context are key. You figure out what something's mainly used for from the ancient world, we need to see more or less where, what else it's next to or within. And sometimes also we can get information about social categories. The hardest one, you might, uh, this might seem funny, but really the hardest one for the ancient world is objects that were used by children. It's really difficult to um, separate those out in many, many cases. So there's a, probably a whole bunch of stuff in museums, collections, um, and analysis that have been labeled ritual objects or miniature, um, miniature ritual objects that may have been actually toys. But we, it's really hard to tell. Even when societies start to use writing, uh, typically there's very, very little in the writing that says anything specific about children. Uh, what they do, who watches them, when, how old they are when they're not considered children anymore and so forth. Uh, but sometimes we can do that. Male versus female, sometimes other genders, it's, it, we can get that. What's used by elites versus everyday people or perhaps certain different um, occupations within settled societies. So any of the things that we might be interested in in our lives today. Right, again, we're staying on the generics because this is the intro part of the class. Later on in the class, we'll look at some specific examples of how these work. Okay, materials, use, social categories. Those might be some of our generals in artifact analysis. When we are doing analysis, we've got three primary attributes that we use to classify them. For projects where universities are working on them and we've got, let's say, undergraduate students who maybe they didn't do the excavation part, but let's say we have a permit to bring the materials back to a laboratory environment for a period of time. This is pretty common where you get a few years and the country or nation of origin has signed off and said, yes, uh, you can take these, clean these, classify them and do the studies. Oftentimes the individuals doing that, the recording of putting the labels on for exactly the layer and their provenience um, and then making sure they're cleaned up and then making some records, some basic firsthand records, sometimes drawings, could be photographs, and then write our computer tables. Those are frequently undergraduate students getting their units for the lab class. And they may be primarily being asked to separate them by form, especially for ceramics um, or other things. It could be though that the project is looking for technology differences, which things are ground uh, versus shaped by striking them by something hard versus shaped by uh, filing versus shaped by some other uh, technique. Uh, with woven things like baskets, fabrics, things like that, technology is really, really important to learn and then classify. And then the last one, style. And you jotted that down the other day, but style again, size, designs, anything extra on it that makes them maybe specific to one group or one family or one person or one purpose. And style is got a lot of options in the universe. So the ones that a group picks helps us to define archeological culture. Right, 
form, tech, and style. So then context again, right? Knowing exactly where they found them, exactly where they came from, what else they were close to, or um, we always find something that's this shape, fairly close to um, a wooden object that is a long um, kind of straight thing with a knob at the end. When we find them in associations in the right context, then we can find out use. Then we're really getting much better at knowing what they use them for or what the purpose. without finding them where they came from or finding them near anything else that was produced or used at the same time, at the same place by the same people, then it's a pretty thing. We don't have a way to say exactly how they used it. Then we're kind of guessing. All right. Ecofax. Now, ecofax are unmodified remains of biological materials. So those of you that said a skeleton of a person is an ecofact, yeah, especially from the ancient world. Now, sometimes those skeletons though might show that they were doing um, head shaping in their infants so that people of a culture had a very specific style of forehead or back of the head. Uh, for us, we have, phases where instead of just regular dentistry that makes any repairs on our teeth look just like tooth enamel, there are some people that like having the gold or silver edges or um, gluing vampire fangs onto their canines permanently. Uh, that would be um, a little bit uh, something opposite, but generally for the ancient world, unmodified remains of biological materials. They're gonna tell us cultural things sometimes, like when we find the remains of bones of fish or rodents or mammals or reptiles, and they seem to be in the same garbage as food remains. Things like corn cobs from the Americas. They're pretty durable. They last for a long time. Paleo, well, this one, paleo just means, here we go, pulling it up, thanks. Um, paleo just means ancient. So paleo feces means ancient poop. And yes, sometimes we do find that. And then what's the hard thing to figure out? Is it a person? Is it an animal? And is it, if it's an animal, what kind of animal? But we do have analysis that can uh, work through that. We're gonna look at a little bit of that in a couple of minutes here. If it is something that's there, but humans didn't bring it in, um, it isn't present in the context because it's directly related to something that a human wanted, ate, um, or used. So then we would say, it looks like it's a non-cultural um, origins. Might be things like rodent bones, bug remains. And this one, this vocabulary word's gonna show up quite a bit. You will see it. Um, it, as part of in, in um, something that's part of the pool of things that you might answer when it comes exam time. Palynology. It's the study of pollen. Pollen comes from certain plants, not all of them, but many of them. So, palynology. Going to link with your preservation. So palynology, the study of fossil pollen. Oh, and I'll put one more thing in here. Pollen 
is plant sperm cells. And that's why it's so durable. It's plant sperm. So since plants can't easily travel, right, and send along the sperm to get to the ovum part and make seeds and make new plants, then it has to be carried by bugs, birds, the wind, or other circumstances, and it has to be able to survive and be pretty durable to climate, weather, dampness, and so forth. So pollen is super, super durable. It's very tiny. Some of it's a little bit bigger than others. But for those of you that are allergic to pollen, now you know why it tears you up so much. It's really durable. It is one of the most durable organic substances that we know of scientifically. And so when it gets in your eyes or up your nose, in your mucous membranes, or you breathe it in and it gets down into your respiratory system, because it is plant sperm, it's also a form of protein. So it's organic. So when organic things get in your system, your immune system says, oh, hell no, that doesn't belong in here. For some of us, it's really your immune system's really fussy with pollen. For other people, it, it isn't very fussy on it. And for some of us, it's just certain species of things. You might have allergies to other kinds of things, but there's good reasons why pollen um, can do that. Now, we recover pollen just from the soil, right, because it's going to blow in on the wind. It'll give us a good idea of kind of what was around. But we also, because it blows around in the wind, we also frequently recover it from very careful excavations. So here's some examples of it. From excavations of, for instance, burials or tombs. And they'll take some samples from in between the pelvic bones to try to get an idea of what their last meal was or what the person was uh, eating or some other kinds of dimensions. And we uh, may frequently get pollen samples out of that as well, which can tell you, this is incredible, it's giving me chills because I'm a nerd. It can tell you what season the person died in. If the pollen's only around in the spring, and there's a bunch of it in their digestive system, then that's probably when the person passed. Super interesting. Uh, why do we care? Because we're just trying to find out everything we can about our ancestors. Okay, now under the most powerful scanning electron microscopes, pollen, right, looks like these little beads or, or uh, fuzzy things, but you all, every plant species makes pollen that has its own unique shape. So when we look at it under the microscope, um, this is a super close up one from an SEM, but let's say we're just looking at under a regular light microscope. Um, then after you do this and you begin to learn what the shapes are and so forth, and you look at it from a couple different angles, you can begin to see what species the pollen came from. I used to do some of this as lab work activities um, for one of my professors when I was in grad school. So pollen was one of my things. We went out and collect pollen from certain contexts. It was very adventurous. It seems boring. It wasn't boring. So, right? So this one, this is Quercus, and so is this one another species. And the reason I picked this one is that we have lots of oak species here in um, the western part of North America. And so we find this in lots of contexts. All right. Pollen, palynology. And again, the name for the analysis of pollen Palynology. So it just has a more Latinized version of the name. Hopefully, you're starting to notice because uh, right now, it'll be more obvious later in the course, but for right now, when I repeat something like four times, you're going to see questions about it. And I just want to be sure that the vast majority of you know exactly at least 50-50 what the answer is. So you do not feel it just popped up and you didn't hear about it or, or it was a new word and you're like, where the hell did that come from? Oops, I used the H. Yes, okay. So macro fossils. Here's some other things that you might see with, um, <clears throat> with questions or readings or examples of <clears throat> ecofacts. So just slow down when you're doing the reading or you see something written, because we have prefixes here in science. And then once you know what they are, then you know what the answer is. We have micro versus macro. 
from science speak. Micro, like microscope, tiny, macro, larger, but in archaeology class, it means visible. Visible with your eyes. So a macro fossil would be something that you can see and you don't need a microscope to do it. So pollen is a micro fossil, but a plant leaf is a macro fossil. So to wrap up ecofact analysis, what are some of our big goals? Why are we paying a lot of attention to these items that were shaped or modified or created by humans? We are very interested in what people brought home. We wanna know, did they go to the ocean and then come back to their village, which is 20 miles away or to a lake? Or did they go up to higher altitude and bring things back down? Is everything really local? So we know they're not traveling very far in that particular environment. And what their choices were. So we can reconstruct how the materials were brought into the location versus what they might have been made into later. Here's another one that's very social. What species in their environment were they interested in? Which ones did they eat? Which ones did they use for other things? Or what things did they ignore? They were in the landscape, but they didn't eat them or use them or have any purpose for that particular type of, let's say, plant or insect or something else. So an example here, right? There's cultures in the world where even today, even urbanites, you go to a market and there are dozens of species of insects there for sale and people snack on them. Uh, that, you're not gonna see that too much <laughs> here where we are right now yet. It's gonna start happening though. Bugs, um, particularly at least um, wormy kinds of things that are high protein and have good plant value and they're very inexpensive to grow. They don't destroy the environment for us to farm them and use them and so forth. We're gonna be things that we're gonna to need to see coming into our uh, diet as uh, urbanites in an overpopulated world going forward. And I still see, I see some snacks now here that are starting to have uh, some, some oddball things uh, uh, added into them. This will allow us to also reconstruct the national, natural environment, especially pollen or palynology or plant remains. Uh, if your site or your location is really ancient, so like two days ago, we saw, two classes ago, we saw a picture real quickly of Jericho that is in the Middle East today. Um, its actual name today is Tel Es Sultan, um, but you see that area and we see that people have been there for thousands of years. Was the climate exactly the same 8,000 years ago as it is now? Or are, do we find sites in the middle of areas that are desert like today? And was it that they had a way to live in the desert or in the past, was it not desert? So Ecofax will give us that good, especially if we're finding them in the stratigraphy farther down, give us that good record of what the climate and environment might've been like. It'll say they give us an idea of availability and the variety or range of resources, how far they're traveling. So lots of different things that we can fill in by looking at Ecofax. So a lot of people whose professions are within archaeology, their main job in archaeology is laboratory analysis. And one of the huge bodies of things that they do with microscope or other types of tech is ecofact analysis. That's really important. All right.
Now, features. A feature in archaeology is when we have evidence of human activity or work, something that is formed because humans live there, working there, doing something in that area. But for us today, it's not portable. So there's a couple of things going on there. So something that we can't remove. If we remove it, we destroy it. So a feature is something where we have an assembly of things, a combination of things, or something that has a lot of parts. Like let's say we find a small structure that dates to 8,000 BC in the modern nation of Syria. We find the base of it, some of the remains. Once we excavate and take those out to look at them later, we have destroyed it. It doesn't exist, right, as a feature anymore. So that's why excavation is slow. So a feature is something that once we move the parts of it and take it apart, doesn't exist in, uh, in its full aspect anymore. It's also things that are really huge that people made that were never meant to be moved around, like a road or like digging a, a um, well or making a dam. Rock art is a feature, right? If you're scratching onto to rock or stone or painting onto rock or stone or grinding it into a shape on a boulder, that's a feature. Yes, these all features that, right, they do show um, that humans were doing something and how they were doing it, sometimes when they were doing it, but for us, it's a different classification. So features give us a huge amount of information about uh, purpose and how many people were working on it and what their needs were. So a hearth, you all, that's right, where you've got your heat, uh, where you're gonna bake something, uh, heat something up, cook food, light at night. That's what a heat hearth is. Earthworks just means anything where they start bringing in sand, clay, other types of soils, piling them up, tamping them down and using it for whatever, for protection, using it to uh, design a special use place on the landscape. Earthworks could be walls and then architecture in general. So whether the building is made out of just uh, branches or clay, or adobe, or bricks, or rocks, just architecture. So what different kinds of information or data do we get from finding features? When we locate a feature at an archeological project, we're very excited, very excited, because we're seeing a grouping of things that were put in a particular spot on purpose and were used together. And it allows us to be much more aware of how people were organizing activities, what things they were using for a real action for a real event and where in their community they decided to do those activities. So distribution of action or organization. If, the remain, if we find the remains of a house, then we might find a lot of things like what did they make their houses out of? Is there any of their equipment or other things about it? Did they make it so that it was up off the ground a little bit? So you had a step going up. Was it dug down into the ground? So you had a couple steps going down. Was it close to any other houses? Was it close to their fields where they were growing food? Right, so organization and distribution of activities at a site. So the size, elaboration or location, burials, we saw an example the other day 
where the burials are right under the floor in the house. But there's plenty of other societies where they didn't bury their dead at all. They left them outside to return to nature. So we, we're just finding out the unique things going on with a, with a place. So that's the features. So here's an example. So you, you probably will see once it's time for um, exam type questions, some images of a few of these things. I'll just ask you, are you looking at an artifact, an eco fact, a feature, something else? So this collection of ceramics right here, everything sitting in here was placed into a hole in the ground together. They've broken over time and gotten kind of smashed um, because this was in a farm area. So this big jar was one great big jar. And then this piece up here actually is a small plate that they put over the top, kind of like the lid. Um, you see a few little pieces of this came off of there. Um, there were some other things around it. It's moved a little bit because this is almost 3000 years old. This one over here is exactly the same shape. It's just a little smaller. There's a plate over the top and they're sitting on exactly the same level of the ground. So all these materials here on the flat space, this is a feature. As we excavate down and this gets cleaned, mapped, photographed and drawn in case something happens to the digital or the electronic stuff, then we start to take it apart and take a look separately inside this and see what was inside these jars, if there's anything that we could find. Um, any other date information here, and then these things are collected, bagged, and labeled, all coming from one feature. So that in the lab there, but once we lift them up off the ground, then the feature is gone, and we have destroyed all these things when they came together. See, uh, I'm going to use this again. I have a question. Sure. Why is it considered a feature when initially there are jars that are movable? Oh, it's a feature because the people brought it all in at the same time. So in the same activity, they dug a hole and brought these things in and set them down. Um, does that make better sense? Because it was one event on one day. Okay, so, I see. Thank okay, so see this, that my hand is sort of in the center of the bigger pot right here. There's something here that's like this. This was actually a dog tooth and it had a little hole. So probably originally either it was attached to something that was fiber or maybe it was a necklace or something like that, but it was an ornament. And then over here, this one, this one's pretty clean, but see these flat angle things that are coming out of the sidewall of this unit? This is not part of the future. Or not future, feature. These later on, someone else dug a hole and dropped all of these broken items. This was trash. So this is a different feature, super interesting. And, and um, for these things, when we got this cleaned out and it was time to start lifting these pieces and we collect all the dirt that was inside in case the dirt has any micro fossils in it that we're going to find in the laboratory at the very bottom of this one and it was a very exciting day um, for archaeology at the bottom of this one in this jar was a baby's head not the whole body but um, a very very young baby's head was inside here so i was the first person at this particular site to find um, something like this it does not mean that they killed the baby to put it in the jar. They may have removed the head from an older burial. This certainly, although we didn't find this part, these two were probably placed either near the head or the foot of someone who was buried. These probably went along with a funeral activity is what we think from that site, but there weren't any other human bones there, only the baby's head that was in there. So when we found that part and I asked the local guys that were working with me, what do you think? They said, oh yeah, those people, they did things like that. They were not impressed. Why? Their answer, it wasn't, they weren't a social group that were the descendants of the people that had built this site. So they were not going to act too impressed, right? So they're gonna have, a features have really meaningful spatial relationships. So they are a feature when they're all coming together.
All right, so here's another one. Sometimes features aren't as exciting as that one. So here's one in a shallow excavation at another site where the um, archaeologists helped us uh, if we weren't there at the site to see. When they were digging down, they found here a hearth, a place where people had been heating something up for whatever purpose. And then they got down to another level and found a really bigger one here. So a hearth is a feature. Now in this case, it's because it's an activity. When we remove it, it doesn't exist anymore. So we have to be very careful to draw it, photograph it, map it, and then collect some of the soil that we bring out of that to see if we can get any information about what they were doing there. So remember again, layers. Reading the layers is stratigraphy. So we're just looking at the layer relationships. Further down means older, which you would have guessed anyway. Okay, so lots of types of features like these. And uh, if we remove them, like let's say it's a walkway, if we remove it because we wanna look down below, then it doesn't exist anymore. So we have to be really careful with taking notes. And I think I have one more big one here. Oh. So again, features can be a complex relationships of quite a few objects. So we're going to do photos, drawing, mapping. Because there's so much there. Later on in the course, we'll look at this site in more detail. So you don't need to remember where this is from, just that once they went down and found, so there's a human body here um, on a, a litter, right? So kind of like the things that we use when we're um, rescuing somebody and getting them to an ambulance or a hospital um, and another person and another and another and another and another, this went on and on and on. And you can see a little bit here, some of them are buried with their head pointing one direction. Some of them are buried with their head in the opposite direction, but they're all at the same level. So this is one big event where a lot of deceased people who are all adults were laid down in the same manner next to each other in the same spot. So all of it together is a feature. And one last one. So, and I did have a chance a few years ago to go to Rapa Nui, very interesting um, in uh, non-locals. It's frequently called Easter Island, which is interesting and culturally not that um, sensitive because the descendants of the originals populations, right, that created these uh, big, foundations for here, carved these large um, stone sculptures, and then moved these stone sculptures and built a whole bunch of other things around them, still live there. So the island's called Rapa Nui, the culture's called Rapa Nui, and Rapa Nui people are still there. So, but it got the colonial um, whiplash of being called Easter Island some time ago. It's, it's still frequently listed that way now. Um, so you can sort of tell with me right there, more or less how big this is. These are huge, I think you all know this, and they're all carved in one big piece of volcanic stone. We know they carved them somewhere else on the island and we know they moved them. But once they moved and positioned them, then they didn't intend for them to move anymore. So all of this together, the base, the steps leading up to it, this wall that they're positioned on, all of the sculptures, and they used to all have hats as best that we can tell and that we find out from the descendants here. Um, all of it together is a feature. So they weren't really intended to move anymore from that. So they're not portable in a practical sense. So we can use the word feature in a couple of, of ways. Conglomeration of things, things that were placed and not intended to be moved anymore. Things that tell us a whole bunch of steps towards one particular result. 
And it could be something typical like a house. All right. So these are features. And you might know the term monolith, but that's not one that we need right now. Um, we're going to not work on this one right now. We'll come back to skeletons later. So, hello. And I am going to 